so is this yes this is on so it's a pleasure to be here and i have a i usually speak a bit too fast so if you think that so just tell it to me i have a combination uh, position so i work both at as a clinician as a senior consultant at the department of endocrinology metabolism and diabetes at the karolinska hospital and then i work with research at the Rolf Luft Research Center. I graduated from the medical uh, faculty at Uppsala University. And that is also from there where I got the speciality in internal medicine and then I did the training for be becoming an endocrinologist here. My thesis work was done at the Department of Medical Cell Biology at Uppsala University. And now I will just stay to this uh, research Part, but you will see that my research is very, what we said, you go from bench to bedside. So it's very clinically oriented. And we shall here just concentrate on these C and D panels. During my thesis work, there came an article where they have shown that serum from patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease had something that affected calcium currents. And as you know, calcium is very important for a lot of cell cellular functions, including insulin secretion from the beta cell. And they saw that they got differences in the calcium current and it was IgG mediated. So I thought that, okay, if I take serum from newly diagnosed type 1 diabetic patients, type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder, and then I take serum from healthy blood donors, and I isolated primary beta cells, incubated them in the culture medium together with either this diabetic serum or the healthy control serum. And here is recordings using the patch clamp technique when you look at the it's single current recordings from calcium channels. And the downward reflections indicates when the channel is open, you know that the concentration of calcium is very low inside the cell and high outside. That means that calcium is a very good messenger. And it has to be totally very well controlled. So in the normal serum, you can see that the openings are like that. But look what happens when you have type 1 diabetic serum. There are so many more openings. And what happens to that? Of course, the cells are exposed to much more calcium. And what happened? They ran into apoptosis. Then I took serum I collected both from children and adults, from a Swedish material, from a Finnish material, as type 1 diabetes has the highest incidence in Finland. Nobody knows why. These are Caucasian population to the majority. So then I wanted some other ethnic background and then as we in our laboratory we have co collaboration with uh, Diabetes Research Institute in Miami, with Singapore and with South Korea. So we have the possibility to do a lot. So then I collected, uh, got a material with uh, serum from Miami. And there it's really a mixed population because they have a lot of Hispanics there. And I could find that in all these from the different parts, from three different countries, I could see that there were sera that gave this higher activity of, of the voltage-gated calcium channel. Then came a work that took several years and you can summarize it in one slide. And this is usually what it is. You spend hours, days, weeks, years in work and then you can summarize it in one slide. Because what was the question? Of course I want to say, what is it in the serum that gives the effect? <coughs> so then came this gigantic work where the serum was fractionated, the bioassay testing the effect on the calcium, on the, on the primary beta cells, and finally, we found one fraction, and we could very surprisingly see that it was apolipoprotein C3. Apolipoprotein C3 is a 79 amino acid polypeptide. It's mainly produced in the liver. It's well known within the field of cardiovascular research because it gives hypertriglyceridemia. It's pro-inflammatory, so it induces arteriosclerosis. It's uh, found on mainly bound to VLDL, LDL, and HDL. 
And here they have shown, shown the structure of APOC3, and this is actually my teacher from uh, clinical chemistry, uh, Gunilla Olive Krona, who is behind this work. So you know, behave well when you are going to the medical school. You never know when you have to face your teachers again. Uh, of course, then I wanted to see how is it with the serum. And then I could see that the type 1 diabetic serum indeed contained more APOC3. Doing research is like being a defense attorney. You always ha ha have to try to find proofs to, to see that your results are really true. So what I did was that I took APOC3, incubated cells with just the vehicle that, you have, uh, that I have dissolved APOC3 in, and here it's, I looked at to, uh, whole cell calcium currents. And you can see that cells exposed to APOC3 gave a higher activity of the voltage-gated calcium channels. Then what I did was that I took, again, isolated primary beta cells, incubated them with a diabetic sera, but together with an antibody against APOC3. And I took APOC3 together with an antibody against APOC3 to see, do I really prevent the apoptosis? Do I really prevent the pathological increase in, in intercellular calcium? And I did. So instead of having dead cells, I have totally normal cells. But these were all in vitro data. And you know, in vitro data, then you are looking at one small <coughs> player in the whole game. So I wanted to do some in vivo studies. And of course, doing it in human beings. A human being can be born with type 1 diabetes. They can be 100 years when they have the onset of disease. So we have a model for BB, uh, called the BB rat. And the diabetes-prone BB rats develop type 1 diabetes, and it's very human-like at the age of around 60 plus minus a couple of days. And of course, that's a perfect model to test because then you have the time to do some preventions or, or treatments to see what you have the effect. So then I had this rat, and we have a known breeding of it. And of course, I had to t really check first, is this a suitable really model for, for the uh, type 1 diabetic serum? Because there is a lot of di uh, species differences. So I could see that, yes, before they turned on to become diabetic, they, their sera interfered with the calcium handling. It, I got the impaired insulin secretion and reduced cell viability, exactly what I saw with the human type 1 diabetic serum. And then I did the, again the test with giving the blocking antibody, and I could see that, okay, I got rid of the effect there. And as the human type 1 diabetic serum, the pre-diabetic BB rats also have increased APOC3. So of course, then I wanted to say this, how can I just reduce the APOC3 to see if there is any effect? So I decided to give antisense treatment during a period of the pre-diabetic phase to lower APOC3 and then to see what happens with the onset. And the antisense treatment is that you have DNA, you turn it into mRNA, and then you have the protein. But here, the antisense is blocking, so you don't get the translation. Uh, the antisense was given with an injection, an IP injection, twice per week, because I didn't want to totally diminish, I just wanted to lower the APOC3. And what happened? Do you think I would stand here if it said nothing happened? No. First, of course, I took it because the treatment was from day 12 to day 40. Then it's 20 days before I expect the onset. <coughs> and at day 20, 40, when the treatment was over, I checked, in the, took a serum sample, and so indeed I have really decreased with the antisense. I have decreased but not abolished APOC3. And here is the Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Here is 100% healthy rats. And as a control, I used an inactive, what we call the scrambled antisense. And here are the control rats giving the inactive antisense, and they become diabetic, as I said, around 60 days. And here are these ones treated with the antisense. And remember, it was only from 12 to 40 days. Yes, this phase during the pre-diabetic. And if you convert it, the lifespan of a rat to a human, 
this delayed the onset of disease by about seven years. And there are several pathways known to regulate APOC3. And from the point of view of diabetes, it's very interesting to see that insulin reduces. And of course, what do you have in type 1 diabetes? You have a lack of insulin. So that's the really natural thing where you have an increase in APOC3. But very interestingly, also insulin resistance, what you see in type 2, in a lot of type 2 diabetic patients, especially those one uh, with had a combination with obesity, you have an insulin. It's like the gene also feels that there is a resistance also in the gene to, to respond to insulin. So then came the next question. Is APOC3 present in the islets? There were no data on this. So what we did was that we took rats for, uh, islets from normal rats. And he, he, here in this experiment, there were over 1,000 islets. Then we dispersed them into cells. And then you can do a cell sorting called FACS, fluorescence uh, activated cell sorter. And then we looked at the expression of APOC3. And here you can see the total when you looked at all the cells. And then, you know, cells have autofluorescence, and that's the way how you can sort them. And we could uh, identify that not only in the beta cells, but we have in the alpha cells. Now there are other cell types too, delta cells, but they are so few, so we cannot really discriminate them here. But we could see that indeed there is APOC3 in the islet. And then we have the question now when we went into type 2 diabetes. We have insulin resistance beta cell failure. These are the two major components of the pathogenesis to, become, to get type 2 diabetes. Is there a link here? We have a model in the lab called the OB-OB mice. And the reason why these mice become obese and hyperinsulinemic and diabetic is because they are lacking leptin. So here is a normal OB lean mice, and here is a fat or not one. There are several mice in this. And here you have the OB, OB. And you can see by time they gain weight, and they, have, they become, become hyperglycemic, becoming diabetic, and they have a hyperinsulinemia. So I wanted to see, what about APOC3 within the islets, as I now knew that there were or APOC3. So here you can see, here they are starting to become hyperglycemic. You can see that there is a parallel increase intra, in the, within the islet of APOC3 as diabetes is developing. Of course, now you already know, now you can follow my research experiments. So now you say, why don't you treat them with antisense? So of course I did. And here I treated them with antisense, and you can see uh, the liver expression is really lower, and so was the serum levels of APOC3. And here you can see that here you have those one treated with the inactive antisense. They are becoming as obese as before, and they are having as bad glucose tolerance tests as uh, the, no the normal ones have. But those ones where the APOC3 was not allowed to increase, had a normal, because they are growing, so they should increase in weight, but that's a normal weight gain, and they have a normal glucose tolerance test. In our lab, we have developed a fantastic technique that we transplant islets to the anterior chamber of the eye. And the idea came from Perul of Bergen, who said that if you can look out from the eye, you must, can, you must be able to look in. And we have a lot of microscopical systems in our lab. Because you know, normally when they isolate or transplant islets into humans, they isolate the islets and they inject them into the portal vein to get it into the liver. And what happens immediately when you inject the islets into the portal vein is that you get the so-called Ibmir effect, the instant blood-mediated inflammatory reactions. Because the blood realizes, what are these islets doing in my blood? So they destroyed them. So of course, it's a, not a very good site to place them into the liver, as you kill about 70 to 80 percent directly of the islets. And that's well known among all transplantation uh, surgeons, so it's not, nothing new. 
So then we said, okay, you can look in, you can look out. And what, we, what you do is that you isolate islets. Then, of course, you anesthetize uh, the animal. And we have done it in rats, mice, non-primate humans. And the first human is also transplanted in Basel in, in, in collaboration with us in July 2016. Then you just make a small, small incision and inject the islets slowly. And the, the patient or the animals is lying down, so by gravity, the islets are attached to the iris. Then you can longitudinally, non-invasively, at single cell level, study these islets. You can do metabolic transplants where you give islets to cure diabetes. Or you can just give islets to see what is happening. And of course, you can directly realize what is this good for? For example, if a drug company wants to test a drug, it's very good. You can directly study what is happening. And you can put other t uh, tissues too. We have put liver, we have put uh, fat, even parathyroid glands. And you know, parathyroid cells cannot be grown anywhere else. But we have put them in the eyes and you can use it. So you, there is a lot of things you can do. And here we have just checked so you get the same amount of, uh, it stays the amount of glucagon, insulin and everything. And why is it so good to put the islets in, in the eye? Because you inject them here. Is there an, are there any blood vessels in the anterior chamber of the eye? No. So all the islets you put in there are not killed by this ibnir. And the vascularization and innovation goes <coughs> much, much faster. Because, of course, you have to get nutrition. You have to get the nerves to work. Because the beta cell is actually a nerve cell. Here it goes so much faster than in the liver because those final islets that reach the liver, it takes much longer time for them to get vascularized. So this is a very, very good site to, to put the islets. And I have done these experiments where I have the OB mice, and then I put OB islets in one eye, and then I took APOC3 knockout islets. And why did I do that? Because I wanted to see if you put islets that cannot increase the level of APOC3, which these uh, knockout islets can not, because they don't have the genes for APOC3. If they are in this surrounding of high APOC3, which the OB mice had, because that, that I've already shown, what happens? And here you can see that the knockout islets are smaller than the OB islets. And what is very good here, because you reduce the number of animals you have to use by 50% because the same animal is the control and the experimental animal, which is very good. And I let them be there in the eye for two weeks. Then the eyes, the eyelids were isolated out from the eye. And you can see that they're a bigger size. Then I wanted to look at the calcium. And the way you can look at calcium is that you can depolarize because I said that they are voltage gated. Uh, so I just give potassium. Potassium is the ion that is the most important for the membrane potential. So I gave potassium, which creates a depolarization, and the depolarization opens the voltage-gated calcium channels, which they should do. But you can see that these OB islets that have increased their APOC3 due to the being in the uh, diabetic surrounding have a higher increase in calcium compared to those ones that were unable to increase APOC3. And what I said that we can use, we have done a lot of studies uh, seeing that they are these islets in the eye report exactly what is happening if you have the intact um, pancreas with the islets. So they are really reporter islets. Then I took a normal mouse and I took the, the controls are islets from a normal mouse and then I put the knockout islets in the other eye. And then I fed them high-fat diet. And they became obese, insulin-resistant, and got the increased APOC3. And then if you look at the islets here, here I looked at the serum levels of APOC3. High-fat diet it really increases, which is known, but you always have to show it over and over again. And the expression within the islets is also increased in this normal mouse. Here it's here are studies done in the intact living animal, non-invasive. We put them to sleep. 
because otherwise they are moving. If you have a human being, they can sit still and you can look in the eye, but you cannot tell them, not even the non-primates, so you have to put them to sleep. And you can see that already after three months, the eyelids were bigger in those ones where you could increase the APOC3. But these APOC3 knockout eyelids remained the same size. Then we injected Texas Red to look at the blood flow, and these vessels are larger, and so the density of the vessel is higher. Then if you label dextran with Texas Red and inject it, and look after 72 hours, when the remnants of the label dextran is phagocytized by the macrophages, you can see that, or you cannot because it's too small, but you have to believe me that in the control eyelids there are more labeled, red labeled from the Texas Red, or from the digested uh, remnants of the Texas, lab Texas Red labeled dextran. So there are more macrophages. What is this indication of? Inflammation. Why do I think that this is important? Well, Mother Nature had al already shown that. Here you have, they are siblings. It's over 90 years in between this because this girl here is still a girl, but she's 104 years old. Because sometimes you should look at the things. And what is, uh, what they did here, they started to look in a group of that why are some people getting not only very old, and they took 100 years, not very old, but staying so healthy? And they started to scrutinize them from back and side and up and down and whatever. And what did they find in these ones? These people were born with a heterozygous null mutation. So lifelong they have only been having 50% of the so-called normal APC3 levels. And they, that gave them a favorable lipid uh, pro profile. They were very healthy from the cardiovascular point of view. They've had an increased insulin sensitivity, lower blood pressure, and that meant that they live longer. And this had been reported in several studies from Greece, and last year it came a very gigantic study from Copenhagen in Denmark, where they have looked at this a prospective study where they have really checked that APOC3 is a very high risk factor for uh, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disorders. So now I took away the question mark and said that APOC3, I say, is a link. I don't say it's the link because probably there are different. Because as you know, if you look here, we are none of, there are non uh, homozygotic twins here, so all of us look different. There is hardly, because they say, how can we solve cancer? There are always di several different causes. Here is one. Maybe in one person it's very important. Maybe in others you have to have maybe a couple of different risk factors. But absolutely, APOC3 is a risk factor. So I say, APOC3 is a bad guy. But you know, you have to have APOC3, but not too much. And I think through evolution, even Mother Nature uh, makes failures sometimes, that we have too high levels left of APOC3. All of us should have dreams, and I have a dream, and that is to permanently lower APOC3 in a safe way. There are already clinical <coughs> trials where they are using antisense against APOC3 for those suffering from severe hypertriglyceridemia that do not respond to other therapies. Uh, but antisense can have some other side effects, so, so we are really looking to find some safe way to lower APOC3. So I would like to say that because diabetes is a very, very increasing disease or disorder. So soon we are over 500 million people in the world. It's, a, of course, a problem for the patient, and it's an economical disaster. But we, if you start to look at, if you are afraid of something, you are not behaving very well, you have to start to look at it as a challenge, to say, what can we do? There are a lot of things we can do. Of course, all of us should eat healthy and move. I tell all the medical students that they, when they pass the word, whatever, if a person is looking for a, some de defects in the toe, don't forget to ask them if they smoke, if they eat well, if they move, because movement, eating, normal food and not smoking is very important. And that is one thing that we can prevent diabetes. But also in some you need some more medical treatment. And of course this work was not done alone. Uh, here are some of them. 
Uh, and Karin Oval is uh, at the present my graduate student who will defend her thesis in September and that is on this high fat diet uh, with the APOC3. Uh, and now comes a geographic question. Now I have been talking for a long time. You have probably not heard my dialect as you maybe don't hear it when I speak English. But now I say this is, I want to know, know the name of the river. <laughs> This is the river, here is one country, here is one country, and behind the mountains is the third country. Which river is this? In Sweden? What did you say? Tornelv, exactly. This is my home country, so here is where I learned to swim. It's a very streamy water, so uh, it's very easy to swim one direction, but we had to swim both directions, so you become a good swimmer if you have to go to the swim school in the Torne River. So here is Sweden, here is Finland, and this island belongs to Finland, and behind the mountains is Russia. So, this was what I wanted to say. 